morning, everybody. I'm Brice Gauthier. And of course, uh, what I will show today is, uh, is the product of the work of several persons who are listed there. And, um, well, we'll try to, uh, to understand the basic principle of piezo response force microscopy. And this is based on atomic force microscopy. So uh, I will start by giving some basic, uh, basic uh, information about the, the, the atomic force microscopy. I apologize for those of you who already know about that, but it's very important that you uh, are aware of the problems of uh, atomic force microscopy before uh, doing piezo response force microscopy. So th then we will uh, describe the piezo response force microscopy, the vertical PFM, the lateral PFM. Uh, we'll make a distinction between the uh, single crystals and the thin films. It's not exactly the same uh, way to measure. Um, I will talk about the domain, ferroelectric domain formation and engineering, uh, and, and show you what PFM can do to study the, those phenomena. Uh, and I will talk about hysteresic loops, so you don't move the tip and make a very local uh, measurement of the, uh, of the, of the, the polarization. I will qu quickly uh, describe what, what is called now the enhanced PFM modes, namely the dual frequency resonance tracking or dual, dual amplitude resonance tracking, which are most widely used now in the laboratories. And very, very shortly, the band excitation PFM. And of course, what is very important is the, 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 this section uh, which is devoted to the artifacts, because um, since PFM is based on AFM, uh, you, will, you will see that uh, many artifacts are possible and those artifacts can mimic the ferroelectric uh, behavior of the sample. So you have to be aware of them to, uh, to be able to interpret correctly the PFM data and you will see that in certain cases uh, non-ferroelectric samples behave exactly like ferroelectric samples and there are some clues that makes you uh, see uh, the difference. If I have time, I will describe a purely electrical method which is based on current measurements by AFM, which helps you distinguishing between uh, true ferroelectrics and, uh, and the fake ferroelectrics. So, let's start by the first part. Near film microscopies. This is a very short section, just to be sure that everyone in this room makes a clear difference between the contact mode of the AFM, the tapping mode, the non-contact mode, and intermediate mode. So, historically, I like to show these images because this is the, uh, this is the, the, the first motivation for near-field microscopies, the atomic resolution. So the, the principle of the scanning tunneling microscopy is the same as uh, atomic force microscopy, which was invented formally to, uh, to the atomic force microscopy. And the principle is always the same. You have a tip that you have to uh, approach uh, very close to the surface there. And if you are close enough, then you can measure the tunneling current and it happens that the tunneling current varies exponentially with the, uh, with the distance there, with some kind of constant there. So it is quite easy if you are able to approach the, uh, the, the tip sufficiently precisely. It is very easy to stop at a very precise location on the, on the, uh, at a very precise uh, distance from the sample, measure that current and keep it constant as you scan over the surface. If you keep the current constant, then you keep the distance between the tip and the surface constant and you are able to, uh, to map the uh, electronic density of state of your sample uh, and obtain the, uh, uh, the, the, the atomic resolutions. And that's very uh, impressive because this, this kind of microscopy is very simple. And all you have to, uh, all you have to do is this object there where the, uh, the radius there is uh, you have uh, several atoms at the end of the tip only. So, images from the University of Franche-Ponté, I should have said Bourgogne also, but, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you have a, a silicon surface, and the, uh, this is the silic uh, doped silicon, and you see spots there, bright spots there, which corresponds to the location, the sole atoms, where boron is not present under the silicon atom. So, this is the undoped silicon atoms there. And the most famous surface, which is the 7x7 seven seven silicon, which uh, uh, was the, f the first to be imaged by AFM. Okay, we're not talking about STM, we're talking about AFM. But this time, we'd like to, uh, to work with non-conductive sample. So, if you want to do that, uh, you can't rely on the tunneling current, of course. So, you, you will rely on this object. This object is the lever. 
This, uh, the size of this, this thing is several microns, several hundreds of microns uh, in length and several microns in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the other direction. And at the, at the end of the level, you have the tip. And you approach this object uh, very close to the surface. And if you want to describe the interaction between the surface and the tip, uh, what you have at your disposal is the leonard jordan potential. So this describes the interaction, attractive interaction there, and repulsive interaction between the tip and the surface. And then you have the choice. If you, if you can describe the interaction like this, you can use either the repulsive uh, interaction of the, uh, of the tip and the sample, or the attractive. If you use this one, you are in contact mode. If you use the other, you are in non-contact mode. Well, PFN is based on the contact mode. So in this mode, all you have to do is to approach until the, uh, the, tip, the tip touches the surface. So you are in the repulsive part of the potential there. And the whole thing behaves like uh, a spring with a, a certain stiffness K there. Uh, if you want to measure, you cannot measure the, the current anymore. So you have to measure the force. And the force is measured through uh, a, a laser, which is focused on the rear of the cantilever and reflected towards a photodiode. This photodiode is at the origin of the measurement of the deflection. But this is, as I will say on Friday, this is not really a, a position measurement. It's an angle measurement. Because every time the lever is approached uh, sufficiently uh, close to the, uh, to the, to the surface, this, the lever bends. And this bending uh, reflects, the, the laser is reflected according to this, to this bending. So you can make the subtraction between the upper part of the photodiode and the lower part of the photodiode and by this way measuring the deflection. And the deflection is uh, proportional to the force that you apply. What you will do during the contact mode is to keep the deflection constant. That means keep the force that you apply on the surface constant. And if there, are, there is any uh, variation of the topography, you adjust the position of the piezoelectric that controls the motion of the tip in the Z direction so that the deflection is kept constant all the time. So this feedback loop uh, keeps the, uh, the deflection constant and the, the voltage that you apply to keep this deflection constant is the topographic, the topography signal. So this is the contact mode. Of course you uh, you, you imagine that the force, the constraint, the strain that you apply on the surface because of the uh, very small, uh, the very small uh, size of the tip, the, the strain is very high, so you can damage the surface this way. It's not a problem for PZT or for fer uh, m mineral ferroelectrics, but it's a problem for polymers, for example. Well, if you are not in the contact mode, you are in the non-contact mode, and this time you use this kind, this part of the, the, the potential. You won't measure the deflection in this mode. You will measure the amplitude of vibration of the lever. This is the lever, and there is a biomorph, piezoelectric biomorph at the, uh, at, at the uh, origin of the lever, and you set it in motion like this. And you measure the amplitude of vibration of this thing by using the photodiode again. And when you approach, when you, if you are able to measure the amplitude of vibration of the lever, this is the, this is the the free amplitude, this is the, the, the relationship between the amplitude and the frequency. When the lever is far from the surface, in red there, when you approach, um, any kind of interaction will displace the resonant frequency of the lever. This means that any time you have a force, this can be an electrostatic force, this can be the van der Waals forces, this can be a magnetic force, any kind of force will displace the resonant frequency um, proportionally to the, to the gradient of the force. So the apparent stiffness of the, of the lever will be either uh, decreased or increased by the force. So you will have a shift of the, uh, of the resonance frequency towards the higher frequency if the, the, uh, if the interaction is repulsive and towards the lower frequency if it is attractive. If you just keep, if you just excite the lever at a fixed frequency like this, and measure the amplitude, you will be aware of the existence of the force by just uh, measuring the amplitude and here you see, you see that the amplitude is decreasing. If you keep the amplitude constant, 
by adjusting the, the distance between the, the tip and the sample, then you, you get the topography of the sample. This is, the, uh, this is a different way to do, this is a different, a different manner to, uh, to proceed, but this is, the no, this is called the non-contact mode. Of course, it depends on the environment, uh, the, the, the quality factor of this curve depends on the environment. You can also measure the phase instead of the, uh, of the amplitude. Uh, most of the time you measure the phase uh, in vacuum. Okay. There is an intermediate mode. I won't uh, tell much about this one because uh, it's not the purpose for PFM, which is called the tapping mode. Well, you're, you are in non-contact mode, but not exactly. You are in <coughs> tapping mode. So you approach the, you approach the lever sufficiently uh, close to the surface so that it taps the, the surface uh, for a certain amount of time. And this is called the tapping mode because of that. And then you can scan the surface without damaging the surface uh, as, as you would do in contact mode. So most of the time for the topography, people prefer to, to use tapping mode if the surface is fragile. Um, in any other case, please use the contact mode because the resolution is better. Uh, so, so it's better. <laughs> now, this, uh, this, is, this is for the uh, fun fundamentals of uh, of atomic force microscopy. Let's switch to uh, piezo response force microscopy. Okay, piezo response force microscopy aims at measuring ferroelectric polarization. That means the the the, 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 the remnant polarization, the coercive fields, and uh, also the direction of the polarization. But it's not possible using an air fan directly to measure uh, the. Uh, this electrical parameter, which is the, 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 the remnant polarization. So you have to rely on the mechanics. So if you want to, uh, to be aware of ferroelectricity, you will rely on piezoelectricity, namely the, 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 the inverse uh, piezoelectric effect. So any time you will apply a, a difference of potential between the tip and the sample, you will have a deformation of the, of the material due to the uh, converse electric effect, piezoelectric effect. This is the contrary to the direct piezoelectric effect, where you have a charging due to a mechanical force. So you uh, you rely on the fact that if you, you take a ferroelectric material there uh, and apply a certain voltage between the this is the tip and this is the bottom electrode of the sample, and if you have a, a ferroelectric material, that means that you have two states of polarization. They are here opposed and in, in the opposite direction. So for the same applied voltage there, you will have a contraction for a certain kind of polarization and an elongation for a certain kind uh, for, for the opposite polarization. So you rely on that physical principle to, uh, to detect the, the, the ferroelectricity. So now it is quite simple. You take the piezoelectric layer, which is also a ferroelectric layer. Well, this is the other way around. You want to study the ferroelectric layer, and this is a piezoelectric layer and you put the tip in contact mode on the surface and you apply an alternating voltage there. Well, later we will also apply a DC voltage, but not now. You apply an alter alternating voltage. Since the, this layer there is piezoelectric, then it will start to vibrate at the same frequency as the applied voltage. This vibration there will be sensed by the tip which is in contact with the surface. So in the photodiode there, you will see an alternating signal due to the piezoelectric effect. Well, by chance, the, the vibration, the piezoelectric vibration is very small. Um, uh, if you want to uh, estimate the vibration, the typical piezoelectric coefficients are some tens of picometers per volt. So if you apply one volt, you have 10 picometers of uh, amplitude of vibration. So this is very small compared to the topography which is in the range of the nanometer. So you can go on recording the topography as if nothing had happened. But if you want to detect the, uh, the piezoelectric vibration, you will use a locking amplifier. So you will uh, isolate the, the amplitude, the, the component of the, of the signal of the photodiode, which, has, which is exactly at the same frequency as the applied voltage. And if you do so, at the end of the locking amplifier, you have two informations, two, two pieces of information. The first one is the amplitude of the vibration. 
So in an ideal world, this information is directly related to the piezoelectric coefficient, but it's not the case. So it's just a quantitative information that gives you some information about the piezoelectric activity of the sample. So this is the first uh, information, and the second is the phase. And from the phase, you will have an information on the direction of the polarization, because the anti-parallel uh, domains vibrate with an opposite phase. So here you have zero degree, it's dark, and then here you have 100, 180 degrees, and this is bright. This is the same location. So from the phase, you have the, uh, you have the, the information that you want. Now let's take a look at a glance uh, to what uh, PFM can do. There are at least uh, three ways uh, to, uh, to, to use PFM. I, uh, I would say two, but uh, the first one is to map the, 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 the polarization. So you have the topography there. It's a lithium niobate from Montpellier. Uh, you have the topography as usual. You have grains there. And um, in parallel to the topography, you record the piezoelectric, uh, the, pi the PFM signal. So this signal there is a mixture between the amplitude and the phase. So you have uh, an information on the, uh, the brightness of the grain, which is related to the amplitude. And you have uh, an information from the sign. Well, this is dark because this is negative. From the sign of the, uh, of the, uh, of the signal, you have an information about uh, the orientation of the polarization that we will detail a little further. Uh, this is the, the difference between this polarization there and this polarization there. So this is, the, this is one way to, to use PFM, domains mapping there. The second way is to stop the tip somewhere, for example there, and to record hysteresis loops. This is what you do when you are studying ferroelectric materials uh, using a microscopic setup, for example, a Sawyer tower uh, setup. You want to measure the hysteresis loops because it is the signature of ferroelectricity. You can do the same you know, using PFM. We will detail the, uh, fundamental, the, the, the technical aspect later. But you can do the same. Just remember that you are not measuring remnant polarization. You are measuring piezoelectric vibration. So the hysteresis, the hysteresis loop looks like this if you just record the phase, so 180 degrees there, zero degrees there, and a fast switching uh, between the two states. Or you can choose to record the amplitude there. And if you record the amplitude, you have a, a different shape for the, for the hysteresis loops, where the, uh, the amplitude of vibration is null at the coercive field there and there. And you have exactly the same amplitude for both states of polarization. So here, this is a perfect hysteresis loop, hysteresis loop that I will describe uh, again later. Of course, this is what you do, but you can map the domain as ground. But since you are using an AFM, it is very easy to uh, impose the sense of the polarization if you work with thin films. Because if you're working with films which thickness is uh, less than one micron, let's say, uh, we are at INL, we're working with, thick, with thicknesses which are no, no, no more than 100 of nanometers. So it, with several volts, you can exceed the coercive field very easily. So you can put the tip on the surface, scan, and uh, apply a certain voltage between the tip and the sample, and impose the polarization in this area on a single direction. This is the same there, in the opposite, uh, with, the, with the opposite uh, voltage. So you can draw any pattern of polarization that you want on the surface. If you can control the motion of the tip, you can control the, the polarization pattern that you write on the surface. Of course, you have to know uh, the precision of this, uh, of this, uh, of this technique, but we will, we will detail that later. Any kind of polarization pattern can be written. OK, now this is, a, this is a first view. And now we will go into details for every, every, uh, every aspect, starting from the, the mapping of ferroelectric domain. So this is, um, this is what you do when you are doing PFM and record only the, uh, the difference between the upper part of the photodiode and the lower part of the photodiode. So this is called vertical PFM. If you do that, if you, if you, uh, if you record, if you analyze this part of the photodiode, then what you, what you measure is related to the, uh, 
projection of the polarization on the axis perpendicular to the sample, sample surface. You, you, you measure only that component, that component. And if you do that, you're, you're measuring the motion of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the surface in this direction. And you have three ways to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, draw the, the data. The first way is to, uh, is to map only the phase. So if you do that, you have a binary information. So is the projection in this direction or is this in this direction there? So in this configuration, if you just record the phase, you have no difference between this orientation there and this orientation there. It will be exactly the same phase. No information about the, uh, the, 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 the direction of the polarization. Or you can also measure only the amplitude. So this, if you do that, you have no information about uh, the, the, the orientation of the, of the polarization in this direction or in this direction. Just measure the, the vibration. So piezoelectric activity there, and no piezoelectric activity there. So this is, this is not binary information, but there is no direct information about the projection of the polarization on either part of the surface there. So you can combine both informations and take the amplitude, multiply it by the cosine of the phase, and you have some kind of mixed signal, which was formerly named the piezo S1 signal or, or PFM signal, and which, is mix, which mixes the two information. So this, this one, the green one there, is in that direction, and green one may be like this, as green two is like this. You can, you can, you can analyze that the, the projection of this grain two is more pronounced in this direction than grain one, because the, the brightness of this, of this grain there is higher than the bright, brightness of this grain there. So from the, this mixed signal and knowing and having information about your sample, you can deduce some information about the relative orientation of the grains. So this is quite interesting to, um, to, uh, to understand. From there, if you have no vertical PFM signal, uh, you have the choice between two situations. Uh, for example, this PZT there, uh, this is a pure cloth, uh, this is a, probably a pure cloth, fa pure cloth phase, so it's not, it's not ferroelectric. So if you have no amplitude, either the sample is not ferroelectric, as it is the case for pyrochlor phase, or the uh, polarization is entirely contained in the plane of the surface. In, the, in these two situations, you won't have any vertical PFM signal at all. So you have to, you have to choose between the, both situations. But if you want to decide whether it is uh, non-ferroelectric or in plane, you can change the tuning of the uh, Oops, I will. You can, you can turn to lateral PFM. This one has been displaced without, without my consent. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and record not the, su the subtraction between the, 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 top, the top part of the photodiode and the bottom part of the photodiode, but from the left part of the photodiode and the, the right part of the photodiode. By doing so, you record the motion of the tip in this direction and not in this direction there. So, if you want to uh, understand this motion, you have to refer to the, the shear motion of the, of, the, of the surface. Remember that you apply the electric field always in the Z direction. You don't have the choice. You have a bottom electrode and the AFM tip, tip is, the, is the top electrode. So, the electric field is always on the Z direction. So, if you apply the voltage in this direction, and record the motion in this direction, this refers to the D15, uh, for example, D15 uh, coefficient, so the shear mode of the piezoelectric tensor. And uh, if, the, if, the, if the motion moves like this, and put the tip on the surface, the, motion, the surface is moving like this, then you have this motion of the lever. Of course, you can have an opposite phase, where the, the lever is like this, on the, uh, if the polarization is in this direction, and the lever is like this, in, if the polarization is in, in this direction. So, by, doing, by, by measuring that, in the in-phase plane, you have grains here in lithium niobate which, are, uh, which show uh, an opposite phase, and this corresponds to 
the, 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 the projection of the polarization in a direction which is perpendicular to the axis of the lever, which is exactly in the opposite direction. So this is, um, by doing so, you can make a map. Look at this. Maybe it, it, will, it will be clearer with an example. This is exactly the same area of the sample. This is still lithium neobate. It's still from Montpellier. And you have the vertical PFM there. Vertical PFM is bright, so you can decide that the projection of the polarization is exactly in the same direction for the blue one and the red one. So you can draw this sketch there. The vertical PFM is the same, but if you take a look at the lateral PFM, this one is opposite to this one, so the projection of the polarization in the Y direction there is opposite. So you have the same vertical, opposite lateral, maybe the polarization is like this. And if you just compare to this one, the vertical PFM signal is in the opposite direction, and blue and, and green are share blue and green share the same lateral PFM signal. Well, this could correspond to this situation. Well, I made a, I made a, a, a nice drawings there, uh, but I don't know nothing about the exact orientation of the vectors. It, it has to be clear that this is a qualitative, uh, qualitative sketch. If you want to know about the exact uh, orientations, you have to refer to X-ray or to uh, any kind of other, other information that you can get for, for the sample and compare to what you see on the, uh, on the, uh, on the PFM signal. Uh, this one is r really uh, disoriented, so I, I, can, I can say nothing about the exact orientation. I can just draw this sketch there. Okay, this is vertical and lateral um, uh, PFM. Going back to uh, vertical PFM, ju I just show an example to show that uh, PFM is not solely intended for ferroelectric materials and can be also used for purely piezoelectric uh, materials, like, thi like this one, for example. This is ZDNO. Uh, sample is from Grenoble, uh, LMGP, and this is a sample from Vincent Consoni. And uh, this, in this sample there, you have two kinds of termination of the ZDNO, uh, ZDNO uh, material. I'm not a specialist of the ZDNO, but what I have understood is that you have a ZDIN termination, a zinc termination, and an ox oxygen termination there. And this corresponds to two directions of polarization, in one direction or the other direction. And if you do the, this is the topography of this sample, one by one micron, and this is the PFM signal. Of course, I cannot switch this polarization, but I can see very clearly the, the different areas where the, uh, the, uh, the polarization is uh, zinc and the area where the polarization is oxygen. Uh, by comparing to... Uh, this, this, this signal is very reproducible, so you can assign to each contrast which one is, is uh, towards the bottom of the... Uh, towards the, the, the bulk, which one, which one is towards the surface. And uh, you, you just make this kind of, uh, of mapping by applying very small voltages, like one, one volt, for example, which corresponds to uh, some picometers of vibration only. It is uh, thanks to the, uh, the locking amplifier. Okay, this is the... Uh, we'll talk about artifacts later. So, if we want to talk about artifacts, we have to have in mind the perfect PFM in image, which will be the reference. And any deviation from this ideal situation will be uh, a clue that something is going wrong with the, uh, with the sample. So this is a perfect image. It is perfect because it is a simulation. And um, you can see that uh, I have, uh, in this perfect image, uh, we draw the ferroelectric domains by ourselves, just by uh, scanning the surface with uh, one, minus, uh, minus uh, X volt, I don't remember the figure exactly, uh, for PFM it's minus 5, uh, for PZT it's minus, minus 5, and plus there. And you see that uh, this is the phase image, this is the amplitude image. Um, for, from my part, I do not use the so-called uh, PFM signal, so amplitude multiplied by cosine of the phase. I always use separately the phase and the amplitude. And from the phase, if uh, everything is correct, you should have 180 degrees between the, uh, the, uh, the, the black part and the, and the white part. 
Uh, if you don't have 180 degrees, something wrong is happening with the signal-to-noise ratio of your, of, your, of your measurement. So you have to check something. But this one is perfect. That happens in the real life. This is PZT. And uh, we write domains, and we have exactly 180 degrees between this part there and this part there. And from the amplitude point of view, when you look at the amplitude, you see the, the dark areas there, which corresponds to the domain walls there. And you have a domain wall there, which corresponds to places where you have no piezoelectric vibration at all. Remember the esteresis loop. And uh, this is more difficult to obtain. So this is, uh, P this is all, again, this is P PZT. Uh, this corresponds to this image. There is a, a large defect on the surface there, on the topography. And you see here, the contrast is inverted because of technical reasons. But you see the domain walls there, the domain walls, which appear as a bright zone. Here in this image, bright zone corresponds to no amplitude. But you see that the, uh, okay, the amplitude between the, uh, the, the inner part and the outside part is almost the same. Uh, well, we can discuss about that. But in the real life, sometimes, most of the time, you have a difference between the, uh, the, this part, the amplitude of this part, and the amplitude of this part. And this is as ground domains in PZT. Well, you see the frontiers, the walls between as ground domains. When you see the frontiers there, okay, you can be confident about what you're seeing on PFM. This may correspond to real uh, frontiers of domains and not an artifact. What you can what you can see from these images is that the uh, the wall is very abrupt. Well, this is also the case for this uh, Asgrand domain there. Um, the the domain walls for ferroelectric materials can be as thin as one single plane, sing one single atomic plane. So in your PFM image, it must be as 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 sharp as this. You see, it's very very sharp. In some cases, you will see later. Well, domain wall is blurred, and the, the thickness of the domain wall is quite uh, large or not well defined. So something is going wrong also if you are in this situation. We, you will see some examples. And last but not least, um, the PFM signal has to be remnant. That means that, uh, okay, AFM is a very slow technique, very, very slow technique. To make a PFM image, you, you need at least 10 to 15 minutes. It's not like electronic microscopy where you have a, an image at once. Well, so you, you, you strongly uh, feel like uh, believing the first image that you have. Uh, so you have this kind of image there, and you don't make a second image. When there is a problem with, uh, with, the, with the sample, you see that the uh, polarization disappears during the second, second image, and after a certain amount of time, there is no PFM at all uh, remaining on your, on your image. Uh, if you are um, confronted to real ferroelectric samples, um, it lasts. Well, this sample has been imaged for one year, more than one year. This is the same area. And you see that what we have written on the surface is still there. So remnants is very important to, to judge the PFM, to, to evaluate the PFM image. Uh, sample from Sylvain de Lambras. Well, now, we're talking about uh, the amplitude of PFM. I will talk about that on Friday during the talk, uh, the, the session of uh, characterization method of this, uh, this conference. But just uh, to, uh, to have an idea about that. Um, many people come to the, uh, to, uh, to the IFM uh, with the, uh, the desire or having of getting some quantitative results in terms of D33, for example. So they want to, see, they want to know uh, the, the D33 of uh, aluminum nitride or PZT or things like that. So it seems very simple to, to, to do. You apply a AC voltage, you get the vertical amplitude, you vary the amplitude of the AC voltage, and the PFM amplitude should scale linearly as a function of the AC amplitude that you apply. From the slope, you have the D33. So, okay, no problem. Just try. So we try. This is aluminum nitride. Uh, in both cases, in, in, the, in the three cases there, this is exactly the same sample. And um, from this try there, you have 3.7 picometers per volt. From this one, you have 17.2 picometers per volt. And this one is 320 picometers per volt. 
It's the same sample. Okay, tell me the value that you want. I will find it. Um, if you change, if you change the experimental conditions of the PFM experiment, you will change the conditions of contact. And on Friday, I will show you the numerous sources of error that you can get from the AFM measurements. It's not, it's not quantitative. Of course, you can refer to a, a, a known sample. Here, this is quartz. So we measure the quartz. We find 2.1 picometers per volt. Well, the real value in the books is 2.3. OK, we can be confident with this value, 3.7, will should not be so far from the real value of the, 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 the piezoelectric coefficient. The problem is that it's not reproducible, so that you can't rely. Well, you find 2.1, but if you redo the experiment the next day, you will find for quartz something which is very strange. Of course, if you keep only the measurement where you had chance, that's not, that's not fair game. So it's very difficult. Well, this is the sources of error. If you want to know about them, uh, just uh, come on Friday, and I will, <laughs> and I will be uh, longer. Okay. Now, the use, the the, the, the practical use of PFM. Uh, you can use PFM on single on on thin films, and you can use PFM on single crystals. It may be strange to use PFM on single crystals because you. Uh, you have an AFM, and uh, the larger voltage that you can apply is 10, is 10 volts. If you want to apply more, it's, becomes, it's becoming very difficult. And uh, the, on, the, on single crystals, you, uh, you, 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 uh, you have very small electric fields because the thickness of uh, single crystal is, is, is usually very, very large. But it's not a problem if you have the polarization always in the, in the same sense. So remember that you have a you have a, a relationship between the elect elastic strain and the applied electric field through the, the, the piezoelectric tensor there. And uh, this is the, uh, this is the rela relative deformation. So if you, if you want to get the total deformation of your sample, you have to make the integral, you have to add all the contributions of the deformation uh, along the, uh, the, the z-axis. So you, you make this integral to have the, the total deformation of your of your sample. If you do exactly the same uh, at the other part of the of the uh, of the of the of the equation, okay, uh, this one is a constant. Then you have the circulation of the of the electric field. You have the integral of the field, the electric field, along the z-axis. This is the voltage. This is the difference of voltage or potential that you apply between the tip and the sample. That means that the total deformation is not proportional to the electric field but it's proportional to the difference of potential that you impose between the tip and the sample. And this is good news because if you have the same contribution of the material throughout the, the sample, throughout the, the whole thickness of the sample, then the contribution will add and you are able to, 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 to make beautiful PFM images with this PPLN, for example, periodi peri periodically pulled lithium niobate with thickness is 500 microns, which has been pulled by external means, external means uh, at Besançon. And uh, you can see the, the polarization towards the bulk and the polarization towards the surface. And you can make beautiful PFM phase image this way. This is because all the polarization is aligned in the same direction in the, in the whole uh, thickness. If you are in a situation where the the, the, the sample is polycrystalline with different contributions uh, in different directions, then you will nullify the PFM signal because this one is cancelling this one and they cancel the averages now. So again, you have to know something about your sample before doing the PFM experiment and you will know whether you will be able to, to get some signal or not. There is something more difficult because, uh, well, it is likely that what I told you just before does not uh, concern the, 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 the total thickness of the sample, just because uh, you are using again an AFM. So this is the tip, and this is very small, and there you have the bottom electrode, which is very, very, very large. So you are not in a situation where the electric field is perfectly perpendicular to the sample surfaces. You are in a situation where the electric field uh, the, the field lines are very concentrated there, and 
and not concentrated there. So the electric field, if you just calculate the Z component of the electric field, it is very intense just beneath the tip, and it is far less intense uh, if, you, if you go further from the tip. Uh, you have uh, at least three orders of magnitude of difference when you go from, uh, this, is the, uh, this is in micron, this is uh, 100 of nanometers there, and after 100 of nanometers, you have already lost a decade in electric field. So that means that uh, most likely, since the, the relative deformation is proportional to the electric field, the, uh, the, 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 the part of the sample which is responsible for the PFM signal is located on the first 100 of nanometers. So uh, this, is, this is a fact that uh, what is beneath 100 of nanometer does not contribute very, very, very uh, strongly to the PFM signal. And you have to be aware of that, o o especially if your sample is not homogeneous in, uh, in depth. Okay, this is for domains mapping, okay? And now we'll talk about uh, domains uh, engineering, writing. Because you have a beautiful tool, uh, with this beautiful tool, you can map the domains and create the domain by yourself. So, okay, let's do that. Let's let's uh, put the tip on certain uh, on a certain uh, location on the surface. This is uh, again PZT, and this small grain here is 300 of nanometers uh, size. The diameter is 300 of nanometers. You put the tip there. You apply I apply 10 volts, and then poof, you switch the you switch the polarization. Since you have a a tool where you can position the tip with a nanometric precision, you can do exactly whatever you want. Um, it's also true for FBN. And, uh, okay, just write whatever you want. Just take a look at the, uh, at the scale there. It's a 400 nanometers. You can switch individually the domains in this image, and the, the, the size of the pattern can be very small. Well, let's have a look at how small a domain can be. Um, you can control this thing because uh, in this image there, just put the tip there and you apply the voltage du during, well, 1 millisecond, 5 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 20, etc. And you see that this domain is plain and this domain is donut shaped like. Um, I will talk about that also later. But you, you see that the more you wait, the, the longer you apply the voltage, the bigger the domain. Okay, that's 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 uh, that seems to be very uh, very um, uh, obvious. Well, if you just take a look at the books, the the growth of the domains, the ferroelectric domains, is governed by the Mertz law. So this this is only the probability that you have a domain in in this direction, and the probability that it switches back to the other direction is uh, controlled by the uh, electric field that you apply and the ratio between the cohesive field there and the uh, electric field that, that you apply. So if you apply this, this field there, the, the domain will switch within TS seconds. Of course, if, if this one is very small, TS is in centuries. But uh, this explains that uh, you put the tip on the surface, you uh, impose a certain voltage, and you have a growth of the domains outside the contact area of the tip and the samples. The domain is bigger than the, the, the area of contact of the tip and the samples. So this is what you find in the books. But um, when you do that, that by, by AFM, what you see is huge domains. I mean, uh, micrometric domains. And the Merck's law is not able to describe that because when you are far from the tip, well, the domain should not switch within centuries. And it does. So we decided to, uh, to take into account the fact that you are using an AFM, you are in air, and you have a beautiful layer of water on the surface. So water is a bad conductor. So you can try and simulate what happens if you, uh, rec if you cover this surface by water and, uh, and, and, and do as if it was a top electrode. And what you see is the growth of the domains due to the, to the, 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 the AFM tip is there, and uh, you see this is the, the domain in one direction, and this is the domain in the other direction. And this is the, this resample to the growth of any ferroelectric domains. First, it grows 
in the z direction and when it reaches the bottom electrode it is clamped by the bottom ele electrode because there the, uh, the, 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 the charge can be comp compensated by the bottom electrode and when the growth in this direction is over you have a growth in the radial direction so uh, in presence of water you can have quite large domains and these domains are stable as soon as you are clamped on the bottom electrode so if you want to create small domains you have to work with uh, thin uh, ferroelectric layers if you do that and if you uh, if you uh, if you make the uh, the simulation you can you can write domains as small as five nanometers in diameter uh, okay we didn't reach this this figure this is just simulation but with very thin layers you can go down 10 nanometers very easily and uh, by doing so you just imagine the if you if you if you uh, if you take this one uh, the size of the domains is a hundred of nanometers well, if you make a simple calculation of the density of integration, if you use that as a memory, um, it corresponds to, uh, to, to very, very, very dense uh, memories uh, compared to what exists now uh, in, the, uh, in, in the industry. You can play with that. You can uh, study the influence of the, the morphology of your sample on the growth of the domains, the, morph the influence of the type of bottom electrode, the conductivity of the top electrode, and so on. So this is what we do at INL, uh, and uh, and it's uh, and it's devoted to the microelectronics. Well, PFM is a slow technique, AFM is a slow technique, but still, you can have some information about the evolution of the domain with times, with time. I told you that uh, ferroelectric domains must be stable. Uh, this is the definition of ferroelectricity. But in some, sometimes the, 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 the sample is indeed ferroelectric and, uh, and the domains are not stable. This is the case for this, uh, this is a lit uh, lit lithium tantalate. It's a single crystal, so it cannot supposed to be non-ferroelectric because it's a perfect, it's a perfect uh, sample. The problem is, is that it has been transferred on, uh, on, a host, on a host substrate by SmartCut. And after this situation, you have a strong shift of the, of the esterosis loop uh, with respect to the to voltage axis like this. And if you j try to, uh, to uh, create by yourself with the AFM tip this region of opposite polarization there, what you see if you wait five minutes is that some regions are flipping back. 22 minutes, okay, you have nucleations of uh, domains which are flipped back. 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and so on. If you wait for a sufficiently high, long time, then the domains disappear uh, uh, completely. This is the same for this one, this is the same for this one. So, even though PFM is a, is a slow technique, you can still have some, some, uh, some information about the domain dynamics. Um, it is not sure that the tip itself does not play a role on the flipping back on the on the behavior of the domain but it does but still you can have some information and if it's not sufficient you can record the PFM signal as a function of time and just by putting the tip somewhere on the surface and uh, recording as a function of time this is the phase signal and uh, here you you put the tip on this location and you apply let's say plus 10 volts you apply plus 10 volts you switch, the, 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 you switch the, 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 the region there, you release the voltage, then you see that this, the, 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 the phase is hesitating there and goes back to the flipped uh, state. So what you see is this nice domain there. Just compared to this one, you are in this situation, you apply the voltage, you switch, but exactly when you release the voltage, this, the, 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 the domain switches back and what you see is this nice donut there so you can access to some kind of dynamics where you can explain there is a discharge phenomenon which is at play there which is responsible for the flipping back of the, uh, of the, of the, of the domains in the central part there but from this PFM as a function of time you can better understand what happens on the surface during the application of the voltage okay now 
Estevez's loops. Um, Estevez's loops are, I, I believe that Estevez's loops contain the real information. Just because you, uh, when you are doing Estevez's loops, you don't scan the tip over the surface. So any kind of artifacts arising from the topography are not present in the Estevez's loops. Because what you have to know is that any kind of error that you may have in the topography will be transferred to the PFM signal. So you have to, you have to, be, uh, you have to, to pay attention to what you are doing with the topography. And uh, by doing hysteresis loops, you don't have any problem with the friction, you don't have any problem with the change of this, this, the, this, the, the shape of the tip, you don't have any problem uh, with the mechanics. So, having said that, you have the choice. If you want to, to, to record an hysteresis loop, the first idea that you get is to do, to do exactly the same thing as at the macroscopic scale. That means uh, if you are measuring the hysteresis loops with a Sawyer Tower uh, setup, you will apply a voltage which is a triangular shaped. Like this, you, you increase the voltage and you decrease the voltage and you increase again and you have a loop. You can do exactly the same thing with the AFM. So you, you impose this voltage there and at each voltage step, you measure, at the end of the voltage step, you measure the PFM signal. You do that uh, at the end just to avoid any transient uh, in, the, in, in the signal. And uh, by doing so, you have something which is quite quick and very close to what you are doing at the macroscopic scale. The problem is that uh, when you are doing that, you, uh, you have an electrostatic field that exists between the tip and the sample when you are doing the PFM measurement. And you will see that it is indeed a problem. So if you don't want to, to do that, which is called the in-field uh, piezoelectric uh, PFM, PFM hysteresis loop, if you don't want to do that, you switch to the off-field hysteresis loop. And most of the time in the, in the papers now, uh, the hysteresis loops that you see are off-field. If you, do so, if you do so, you impose, you apply pulses of voltage. And the, the amplitude of the pulses is increasing and then decreasing and then the other way around in the, in the opposite sign. And you're doing the PFM measurement after a certain time, an idle time, and uh, you can control, of course, this time. And this, the, the, the order of magnitude is some hundreds of milliseconds. So you wait let's say, a hundred of milliseconds before doing the PFM experiment. That means that you have no uh, applied voltage when you're doing the PFM experiment, and you hope that you will have no electrostatic interaction during PFM. Let's take a look at the difference. Well, okay, uh, the hysteresis loops are very, uh, uh, very useful because if you have a sample like this, this one has, a vert has no vertical polarization, and this, this part has a vertical polarization. And of course, you have hysteresis loops in this area and not in this area. This is obvious. Let's, let's do something else. Uh, this is the perfect off-field loop. I already presented it. Very square for the, for the phase. And the same level of amplitude for two states, this one and this one. And of course, this is the sense and this is the right sense there. I should have ind indicated it. And uh, you have zero uh, amplitude there and zero amplitude there. Uh, this is not exactly the case for that. Well, now, why is it important to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to perform off-field loops? This is an example of an, uh, a pathologic hysteresis loop. This, is, uh, this one has been made on the non-ferroelectric sample, namely uh, silicon oxide. Amorphous. It's not supposed to be ferroelectric. But what you see is that you have indeed a ferroelectric, uh, what, what resembles to a ferroelectric hysteresis loop. And you see this part there, which is very linear. And this part there arises from the electrostatic contribution. If you are doing Kelvin force microscopy, you know that if you apply an AC voltage on your tip, this is the amplitude of the AC voltage. Then you have a force acting on the tip, which is also sinusoidal, and which is proportional to the uh, der derivative of the capacitance of your system. And there, it is proportional to the difference of potential between the tip, V0, and the, the, the tip, VDC, and the surface potential, V0. So it is proportional to, the, to, 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 to this, this, this guy here. 
And uh, if you have any kind of charge deposition on the, on the surface, or if you have any ki kind of charge trapping in your sample, then this surface potential is not known. And then you have this figure here, which is not known. You have a force acting on the surface which is exactly at the same frequency as the piezoelectric vibration. And this, vi this force there, so the amplitude of the vibration due to this force, is proportional to the voltage that you apply. It is indeed proportional to the voltage that you apply. This is exactly what you measure. This linear part there is the capacitive force acting on the tip. It is not the piezoelectric displacement of your lever. So, um, this, is, this has been recorded on silicon oxide, but also on barium titanate, which is supposed to be ferroelectric. And any, 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 any time you have a problem with charging, uh, charge, uh, charge uh, trapping, then you will have this phenomenon active. Um, look at the difference between the infield field and the off-field field. This is another, this is another um, sample. It is, uh, uh, ah, I don't remember, I will, I will find it again. Uh, look at the infield, the infield. It's not the same, it's not the same sign, compare. It's like a mirror. And the uh, hysteresis loop is in the wrong sense. It's not, it's not, it's not correct. Compared to off-field, the hysteresis loops is, the loop is, is completely correct. Here you have a problem with the charge trapping. What you see is not piezoelectricity, it's charge trapping and the trapping and trapping and the trapping. This is what oops. Sorry. Uh, this is what happened there. When you increase when you increase the voltage there, you you trap charges in your sample and they are released there, then you trap charges the other way around and they are released there and so on and so on. What you see is charge charge trapping. But the loops are beautiful. So the, the conclusion of that is that you, be, you have to gain information about your sample. The maximum information that you can get is, uh, is, uh, is, is a good thing. And the second thing is that you have to do both. The infield and the off-field hysteresis loops. Because if you are in this situation, I already talked about this sample. You, you remember the, 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 the polarization is switching back to, this, to its original position because of the shift of these Therese's loops. So the, the sample wants to be in that state and not in that state. If you are doing remnant off-field uh, polarization uh, Therese's loops, then you will have nothing on this kind of sample. Because, just take a look at this, uh, this, uh, this graph. You uh, apply a, vo a voltage pulse. You switch the, the, the material in this direction. You release the voltage the material flips back, and so on, and so on. And any time you're doing the PFM measurement, the sample will flip back, and you will never, you will never see anything. Uh, you will never have any hysteresis loop if you choose the off-field mode. But if you choose the in-field mode, then you will have an hysteresis loop. And the contrary, if, you, if you're working with a leaky sample, with charge trapping, don't believe the in-field, believe the off-field. Any, 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 any sample has a, a, a story to tell. So, so it's important to be aware of that. Okay. Um, now I will switch to, um, to the, uh, to the uh, enhanced mode of the, of the PFM, which I'll call the uh, dual frequency resonance tracking. And I will say a few words about then station PFM. Um, Dual resonance, dual frequency resonance tracking is is, is used by everyone now, because uh, uh, this is a matter of noise. Um, when you are working with uh, materials with a high piezoelectric coefficient like PZT, uh, things are easy. You uh, you apply a voltage uh, a voltage with a frequency which is far below the resonance, the contact resonance frequency of your sample. This is, uh, this, is, uh, this is what we will detail a little further. But if you have low piezoelectric coefficients, then you start to, uh, to uh, the, the PFM signal start to disappear in noise. And uh, if it disappears with noise, 
then uh, this is the perfect PFM signal. This is the P plus signal, and this is the P minus signal in a polar representation. You have zero degree, and you have 180 degree. And this is the, uh, this is the perfect PFM signal where they are strictly opposite one to the other. Um, if you just uh, move the frequency of this kind of measurements, if you move the frequency, and using this polar distribution, this is done by Jung, uh, you see that you have any kind of result. So your, your, your signal can be anywhere in this polar plot. It can be there, it can be there, and, 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 um, and etc. What happens? If you have noise, you can represent the noise by a, a vector in this polar direction. You can't control the, the length and the direction of this noise. And from this noise, you will add the PFM signal. So the PFM signal is still perfect. You have an, a, a, 190 degrees between the P plus and the P minus, and uh, they, it adds ve uh, vectorially uh, to the noise. And then this is the result of the PFM signal. This is what you get from the P plus, and this is what you get from the P minus. You see that there is no, there is not any more 180 degrees between the two, uh, between both states. And most, and most importantly, the amplitude of this black arrow is not the same. The length of this black arrow is not the same as the length of this black arrow there. So instead of having a perfect PFM signal with a null signal at the interfaces and exactly the same amplitude, you will have this kind of signal with an amplitude different and a phase which is not 180 degrees between two uh, different uh, opposite uh, polarization. So this is because of noise. And what you want is to uh, enhance the signal-to-noise ratio so that you extract the PFM signal from the noise. Remember that the PFM signal is always very weak and that you have to extract it with the locking amplifier. So if the piezoelectric, uh, the piezoelectric coefficient is weak, it becomes very difficult to, to work. So let's try to enhance the signal-to-noise ratio. The, thir the first thing that you can think, the first thing that you can think, <laughs> is to, uh, to uh, go to the resonance frequency of your system. Because you are um, in contact mode, but still you have a, a contact resonance frequency. Uh, if you compare uh, if you excite the lever, the, uh, the free lever, you will have a, 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 a resonant frequency here. If you are in contact, the resonant frequency will be higher because the, st the system is stiffer, but still you have a resonance. And this resonance can be uh, obtained by exciting the lever while in contact with the surface. If the, the surface is moving due to the piezoelectric effect, you will be able to uh, to, uh, to work at the resonance frequency. This resonance frequency is 4.4 times the free frequency there. So, okay, go to the resonance frequency, apply the same volt, and for the same volt, you will have a response which is enhanced by a factor of Q, if Q is the quality factor of this resonance. Seems simple. It can be also uh, applied to non-piezoelectric sample if you excite with an acoustic actuator. That's not the, the purpose. The problem is that you know now that the, the resonance frequency will shift any time uh, an interaction is present between the tip and the sample. This is the non-contact mode. It's, it always applies uh, for contact resonance frequency. So any time anything changes with the contact of the tip and the sample, you will have a shift of the resonance frequency, uh, the, the contact resonance frequency. That means that if you, if you just uh, excite the sample with one single frequency and see the variation of amplitude, uh, this variation of amplitude is not due to piezoelectric uh, uh, properties of the material. It is due to uh, the roughness of the sample, the hydrophobic or hydrophilic uh, nature of the surface, any change you can imagine. So it's not possible to uh, it's not possible to stay at one single frequency because the variation are not uh, it's not possible to interpret variation as in terms of piezoelectric coefficient. So you have to find a way to enhance the signal to noise ratio and avoid misinterpretation of the data. 
Well, this is called resonance tracking. So instead of exciting the sample with one single frequency, you will excite the sample with a carrier, which is more or less at the resonance frequency. And you will add a modulation to this carrier. So this carrier is at the resonance frequency, let's say, four kilo, 400 kilohertz. And you had a low frequency modulation. And in the Fourier space, you get two satellites. And what you measure is the amplitude of vibration at this frequency there and at this frequency there, corresponding to the carrier plus the modulation and the carrier minus the modulation. If the, if the carrier is centered exactly at the resonant frequency, you should have exactly the same amplitude for both. Of course, you imagine that the, the curve is a perfect Lorentzian, which is symmetric. It's not the case, but it's not, it's not a problem. Um, and when you're doing PFM, there is a problem. You have three sources of signal uh, that generate a signal at exactly the same frequency. So you're applying a, an alternating voltage, you get an alternating vibration, mechanical vibration, due to the converse piezoelectric effects. This is what you want. But in the same time, we have already seen that you have an electrostatic force due to uh, the application of the, the, vo the alternating voltage and the difference in potential between the tip and the surface. This is, this is called the capacitive coupling. And this is called also the electrostatic interaction. But you have also a, a signal which origin is chemical, which is due to uh, if you have any kind of ionic conduction, ionic mobility in your sample, which is the case when with lithium-based sample, for example, and where you have motion of these ions within the surface, and because of this motion, you have a variation of the volume of the material, which is just beneath the tip. And this variation, is, this vari this variation of, of volume follows the, the excitation that you impose. So since the tip is located on the surface, it is repelled by the variation of volume, and it follows this motion there. This is not piezoelectricity, it's purely chemical. From these three parts of the sample, of the, from these three origins of signals, you, you, you have to be aware of them because any of them can be uh, predominant in the PFM signal. Silicon oxide. Amorphous silicon oxide. I, I told you that you had to, uh, to wait until, this, until the second image. Look at that. Um, it's a very thin sample. You apply 5 volts, minus 5 volts. I have to say that there is no injection of current. So I didn't, there is no dielectric breakdown. And the surface is, uh, is, uh, is not damaged. And uh, this is the first PFM image. Okay, SEO, uh, silicon oxide is ferroelectric. Um, wait 9 minutes, it's not so bad. 18 minutes, 72 minutes, the signal is disappearing with time. And uh, if you're doing an hysteresis loop, this is what happens. We already talked about that. From these short remnants, from this hysteresis loop, and from, of, maybe you can see that, but you can see some kind of square. You see that on the topography. This is the topographic mode. This is the topography of the, of the sample. You see the square there? This is an electrostatic ghost. This is the action of the, uh, the electrostatic action on the lever. So I, I, I said that the, the topography was not damaged. It is not. But here, uh, something has happened with the surface charging. And you can, you can still see that, that in, the, in, the, in the topography. So this is not, this is not ferroelectricity, although it resembles to, to ferroelectricity. Um, to be aware, aware of that, you can, you, have, you can increase the frequency of operation. So I, don't, I won't go into, deta in, into details, but, but if you, it was done by the group of Kalinin at, uh, at um, Oak Ridge. Uh, and if you increase the frequency of operation, just choose a very stiff uh, AFM tip, for example, 14 Newton per, per meta. And if, if you do that, the resonance frequency, if you're working in DFRT mode, will be higher than the megahertz. And if you do that, the electrostatic contribution is disappearing. 
this is uh, this is uh, you can see that from this graph there the electrostatic interaction is active in the green part so if you increase the frequency this is the frequency there you just keep the electromechanical action of the uh, uh, the uh, that you want to measure so if you increase the, uh, the, the the frequency for example if you have this nice uh, PFM images and hysteresis loops on uh, gallium ferrites there increase the frequency of operation and you have nothing on the image nothing at all so what you see on this gallium ferrite is charge injection if you do the same thing with PF uh, with PZT you keep you keep the, 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 the signal this is the same uh, operating mode as this is low frequency at high frequency I didn't put the image because there is nothing to see uh, you, you have only noise and this is PZT at high frequency you, see, you still see the, the signal so this is what you can do to be completely sure that something is that uh, the, the signal is, is, uh, is stereoelectric aluminium lanthanide this is what I was uh, thinking I, I was uh, searching for this name um, 3 nanometer thick aluminium lanthanide amorphous well, it's, even when it's crystalline, it's not ferroelectric. Um, perfect PFM image. And uh, if you wait 72 hours, still perfect PFM image. It's amorphous, again. Um, off field loop, perfect off field loop. It's, it's scary. Um, because uh, in, in that case, uh, if you don't have any information about the origin of the sample, well, it's very difficult to decide whether it is ferroelectric or not. I will talk about what is possible, what PFM can and cannot do on Friday. What PFM cannot do is proving that the sample is ferroelectric. Because this one is not, and this one behaves exact, exactly like a ferroelectric. Now, of course, if you are doing in-field loop, I didn't mention that, but if you're doing in-field loop, you will see the charge, the, the charge trapping. You will see that uh, the hysteresis loop is not in the right sense. But it's the same for barium titanate, which is indeed ferroelectric. So it's very difficult to decide. To decide. Uh, if you're doing DFRT, you still have the signal, you still have the remnants, you can't re get rid of it, and it's not ferroelectric. So now, look at this. Uh, amorphous gallium oxide um, again it's amorphous 48 hours later you still have the signal here you have a clue that something is going wrong look at the the domain walls this is the phase image it's blurred so it can happen when you have charge injection so this is the uh, the first PFM image you see the very abrupt apparent uh, domain walls there Okay, everything is fine for you. But if you wait, you see that this signal is disappearing slowly and that the, the, the domain walls become blurred as if something was uh, uh, diffusing in the sample. This is charges. So you have charge diffusion. And uh, since the, the signal that you record is directly connected to the injection of charge, which are diffusing in your sample, then the separation between the, the, the apparent ferroelectric domain, which are not ferroelectric, is blurring also. Um, this is barium titanate. Uh, from crystallography, it is ferroelectric. And uh, this is the first image that you get. Okay, not so bad. For 24 hours later, nothing on the surface. Um, this is better, this is worse than gadolinium oxide. This one is ferroelectric, supposed to be ferroelectric. This one is not. So from this one, from this, the comparison between the, the, the two situations, you can't prove that barium titanate is ferroelectric with piezo response force microscopy. It's not possible. But you can prove that a sample is not just by uh, the remnants, which is short. OK, this signal will disappear, so it's not ferroelectric. You can combine in-field and off-field hysteresis uh, loops and see the charge trapping. This is not the right sense. You can also increase the amplitude of, of VAC. If you include the amplitude of VAC, you know that the, uh, if this is ferroelectric, 
and the amplitude of the alternating voltage is higher than the coercive field, then your, your sample will switch all the time, like this. What you will see is that the PFM signal disappears. If it never saturates, then it's not ferroelectric. But what you see is Kelvin force. And you can use also stiffer cantilever. We, uh, we talked about that uh, just, uh, just before. Okay, so uh, I thank you for your attention and I'm ready for your question if you have some.